Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody, for coming. And it's the after-lunch food coma session. So hopefully you stay awake. I have someone in the front row who was dreaming about Ryan Gosling before, and I said, well, I'm going to get up on the stage now. So thank you for coming along to what hopefully will be quite an informative session for you guys, because I'm tipping you are all in-house recruiters, where by the end of the session, you will walk out as in-house talent acquisition specialists. Because really today, we're going to be looking at the difference between the two and where you might sit in your current practice today. The accent, yes, it is Australian. I'm from Sydney, but I actually live in San Francisco, which is where the, um, the headquarters of my business is. But I've been doing recruiting for 27 years and have probably dealt with over a thousand in-house recruiters slash heads of talent acquisition in probably about 55 countries. So these are gonna be anecdotes, tips, suggestions that me and my organization are hearing on a daily basis that when Mark asked me to present, I said, I'm going to make it extremely real because you guys are at the coalface, you guys are doing what you do best and what I hope is that you will walk out of here and be able to implement at least one or two things when you get back to your desks. Some of you I know are going back to your offices this afternoon, but potentially tomorrow. So a little bit of an agenda before we launch straight into it. And I'm happy for you to get copies of these slides. I don't know if I've got to announce that publicly or my email address will be up at the end and you can actually get a copy of the deck so that you don't have to be taking photographs from up the back. Um, but I don't know whether you ask yourselves at all whether you are recruiters or talent acquisition specialists. And if you do think about that, whether you then delve deeper and, and wonder what the difference is, how you would conduct your day-to-day -day differently if you were to make the shift from one to the other. And the premise of this presentation is when my organisation gets briefed from heads of talent acquisition, they tell us that they are shifting from a recruitment model into more of a talent acquisition model. I then say to them, can you elaborate? And they say to me, well, you know what we mean, Paul. And I say, I need to hear it from you. And sometimes the client says, well, we need to do more sourcing. I don't say anything. And then they say, well, we sort of, we're looking to build some form of talent community. You know, Paul. And I say, you are the head of the talent acquisition team. Why are you asking me? And they say, because we are trying to shift from a recruitment model to a talent acquisition model. And ironically, they are asking an external recruiter to help them with that. But what I'm going to show you this afternoon is how as at the desk, in the business, and dealing with your stakeholders, you can start to shift from what in Australia we would call a bums on seats if they've got a pulse and can start on Monday mentality, into a far more strategic, forward thinking, and searching for the leaders of the future of your organisation, pause, methodology, that's the talent acquisition side of things. I'm not sure who here works for large enough organisations where you may be building talent pools, talent pipelines, talent communities, whatever you choose to call them, we will be looking at that because one of the biggest transitions from the reactive recruitment piece into the proactive talent acquisition component is the ability to engage, deliver an amazing pre-candidate experience to a live talent community of people who are engaging with you voluntarily, they opt into this so you are not spamming them, and how they then engage with you up to the point when you say, we have something potentially for you. We'll cover that. You walked into this room, into this Arctic circle, which is hopefully going to warm up, as recruiters. But I'm hoping you'll walk away with an element of an online marketing focus when you walk out. Because part of the big transition into this talent acquisition model is the ability to think like an online marketer. I don't know what you guys do, whether it's full 360, whether you are sourcing, 
whether you're engaging and doing your outreach and pre-qualification, whether you are doing the recruitment and delivery, or you're doing the onboarding component. I don't know. But I will be focusing on what one should be doing in this talent acquisition capacity from an online marketing component, because if you think of products or you think of services and the way they are targeted towards potential audiences, you have a potential audience out there, a live audience that you have to tap into at some point. And if you don't do it like a marketer, you're just doing it like a recruiter. And that's the piece that we are going to change. We'll cover some sourcing techniques. Like I said, I'm not sure who here does dual or hybrid sourcing recruiting or who does either or. It's been said that recruiters can source but sources can't recruit. We could ruffle feathers and cause a bit of a debate, but I'll move straight on. But we'll be covering some techniques and some tips and I'll be giving you a couple of um, little secrets that you can take away if you would like. There have been plenty of discussions already this morning around the power of the employer brand and how it helps. But I'm going to reinforce that because my slide deck was already ready. And even if you've heard it before, it's good to be reinforced in the afternoon. And we'll look at a few metrics because as in-house talent acquisition specialists, you are held to account by your hiring managers, by your heads of talent, by your heads of HR, by your B VPs, whatever you call them, around certain delivery metrics. I don't know whether you're going to be thinking about, here he goes, about cost of hire, time to hire, speed to deliver, speed to productivity. We'll be covering some of the metrics that you can look at in conjunction with your hiring managers to actually ensure that you are adding real value. Because what often happens, and I do presentations like this literally in all corners of the world, someone puts their hand up at the end and says, Paul, that was quite informative, but we can't get this past the hiring managers. We are stuck between the candidate and the hiring manager. We are the jam in the bread or the jam in the sandwich. Yes, you are. You've got to push the bread away and start to take a bit more control of this process because you are the talent acquisition specialist delivering for the hiring manager who is going to be the person's boss, but you are the one to acquire, source, attract, select, and then become involved in their attention piece as well. So I've already asked you, are you recruiting or are you adding, sorry, are you recruiting or are you acquiring talent? And maybe you've got a title on your business card. Maybe you have an email signature that says talent acquisition specialist, but really internally they just say, oh, just go and see the recruiter. Go and talk to the internal recruiter. We'll just brief the internal recruiter. There's always a just before the internal recruiter. And what we need to shift is that it's not just. What you are doing is the ambassador-bearing, flag-bearing, employer-brand representation of your organisation. So you have to think differently around whether you are reacting to a job brief that's dumped on your desk and the clock starts now, or whether you are adding value to your organisation by proactively engaging candidates who at some point down the line may actually express an interest in an opportunity with your business. Are you the quick fix or are you the strategic? Are you tactical? Are you forward thinking? If you look at this next slide here, recruiting has typically been based on rejection almost. You run a process, you eliminate people and you start again whether it be through advertising, screening, selecting, reviewing, benchmarking, presenting, the process then stops when the job is filled. When you fill the rec, when you fill the brief, when you fill the job, whatever your internal lingo is, the recruitment process stops. But the talent acquisition process, which is around engaging people who are in a bubbling, thriving, live talent community who have expressed an interest in the content you're putting out, not just the tweets about job vacancies, but the content that you're putting out around your organisation and they have said, I opt into this, I want to be part of this and I want you to communicate with me around what your organisation is doing. I want you to know that I'm here I'm interested, I'm engaged in your organisation. 
walk out there, how many of the booths say, reduce your time to hire by a percentage point? The only way to reduce your time to hire is by having the people you are potentially going to deal with there. You don't go and source them. You don't go and screen them. You don't advertise for them. You have them humming along and bubbling in front of you. This is a bit of a long-winded definition from Burson by Deloitte, but really, and I will read these two um, statements out if anyone can't see it up the back, talent acquisition is a strategic approach to identifying, attracting and onboarding talent to efficiently and effectively meet dynamic business needs. Recruitment is the tactical component of attracting and identifying job candidates. So if the way you are interacting today with your hiring managers is that they say, Paul, I've got a brief for you, and you go, okay, let's get on with it and let's start to run the process. We'll write ads, we'll get them approved by you, we'll post them on the job boards, we'll have the sourcing done as well, we'll then get together a long list, I'll run them by you. You can hear the time clicking in your hiring manager's head to say, well, when am I going to get my first candidates? Or if there's conversations around what do our hiring plans look like for the next six months, where you've strategically sat down with them and said, okay, we've got 1,800 people in a talent pipeline around this vertical within our organisation within the sales organisation, within the tech side of the business, within the shared services side, within the customer facing side, insert your departments. If you have the pool of people ready and you can tap into those, that is adding value to your hiring manager. That is adding value to your organisation because immediately you're not having to do sourcing, you're not having to run ads where you will be inundated I'm not sure in the UK what the average number of responses to any job board ad is. In Australia, it's 189. 189 responses to any job board ad. Usually, an organisation says two or three of those people were good. If you've got a talent pool or a talent pipeline or a talent community that you can tap into, each of those people has said, I'm interested in your organisation you know whether they would potentially sit in the sales division, in the customer, sales, customer service division, in finance, in HR, anywhere. You don't have to go and hunt for them. So if you are looking to potentially add this concept of a, a talent community to your business, it's around the acronym there, the ABC, to always be cultivating. I'm sure it happens here in the UK on the sports side, in the football teams. In the US, they've got talent scouts going out to all of the universities. When some poor guy is 15 years old, they go, he'd be great for NFL, NBA, whatever. Probably here the same for Arsenal, for Chelsea, whatever the teams are. The talent scouts are out years before to identify the people who are going to play in this team in 2026. They're 12 years old. He's got what it's going to take. If you're thinking six months out and you're starting to identify people who you think they would be good for our organisation, not about the role, they would be good for our organisation because they're already engaging in our organisation. They're sharing content that we're putting out from our organisation. They've opted in to hear from us about jobs, content, events we're doing, um, corporate social responsibility information that we're putting out there. They've already engaged with us. The idea here is that you have people who are interested, available, screened and qualified well before the opportunity, the rec, the brief, the job post, whatever you're going to call internally, lands on your desk. Suddenly, from recruiting, you've shifted into talent acquisition and you are proactively saying to your HR or talent acquisition heads or to the line managers, 
I've got someone I really think you should see. I know we don't have a vacancy now, but this person is perfect for what we need in this business. What you're doing is you're suddenly controlling the process. You're not the yes person to the hiring manager where the gun's to your head, the clock is ticking, and unfortunately what happens time and time again is the pressure just mounts, and we'll come to a slide in a moment, and you literally just start throwing CVs at them, hoping that they'll say, yep, I'll meet this person, yep, I'll meet this person, because you've met the metric around time of shortlist presentation. It's very different to the metric around the quality of the candidate you are providing. So you want the qualified, interested, and available people. How do you know they're qualified? Because you've already pre-qualified them because they've opted in. How do you know they're interested? Because they're sitting there right in front of you saying, I'm interested here. You haven't had to advertise. You haven't had to go sourcing. Um, this is an Australian company as well. It's called Live Hire. They help organisations globally build these talent communities. And what it's about, it's about delivering a candidate experience it's about ensuring that you can tap into a database that's so old and invite people in and they will start having updated live information. If they're an organisation now and they move and they update their CV, you get the live CV updated. You're not calling a candidate to say, look, I've got your details, it's a little bit old, are you still here? No, I'm not, I moved on three years ago. You have everything at your fingertips. If you want the interested, qualified and available, you need to be building a live talent community. Not a database where you can only do one-way information sharing. You can only send something to a database. A database cannot speak back. If you've got a talent community where you're asking for feedback, asking who's interested, asking what people are looking for, that's showing that you are actually in talent acquisition and not in bums on seats, I'm only interested in the recs I've got on today. Because that's one of the complaints that candidates give, is that they get thoroughly briefed on one role, but never considered for another. Because right now, you have your mind set, I must fill this role. Talent acquisition, what sort of talent can we bring into the company for future opportunities? Quick show of hands, who is involved in the sourcing and the engagement of future candidates or who is more on purely recruiting? Who does the engagement, outreach and sourcing piece? And who is purely delivery? How stressful is the hybrid role? Can I have a noise? I know it's a British audience, but can there be a bit of... It's horribly difficult to run hybrid because one moment you're a cyber sleuth and the other moment you are working with your candidates. One moment you're trawling lists and lists and lists of prospective candidates and the next you're hyper enthusiastic and selling an opportunity. It's very hard, that's why I said a few minutes ago, recruiters can source but sources can't necessarily recruit. If the true cyber sleuth was put in front of a candidate to interview, no, it's not going to happen. But if you are a talent acquisition specialist, we need to make sure that the engagement piece is correct. And one of the ways we can be adding value to candidates, now we're shifting, we're adding value to the candidate, is to be potentially using multiple touch points, reaching out to these candidates to say, hey, you're part of this pool, what interests you? If all you're doing, and Katrina before was talking about spamming candidates, if you're spamming candidates, you're probably going to get radio silence. If you're engaging with people in a pool that have opted in to hear from you, you will start to hear back. Again, I'm not sure what the statistic is here in the UK, but in the US and Australia, if somebody sends an in-mail there's a 2% chance that a response will come back. 
if somebody sends an email to somebody inside the live talent community, there's an 87% chance that they're going to get a response. And of the people that are responding, most of them are actually saying positive stuff, not please leave me alone. So you've got nearly 90% of people saying talk to me versus the vortex where the in-mails go. And of course then LinkedIn says, but if you don't get a response, we'll just top up your credits. That's lovely. You don't want credits, you want responses. So if you want to be adding value to the candidate side of the house here, you need to be engaging with them in various ways. Now, there are many arguments out there that say, actually the email should not even come from a recruiter. You should try and get the head of technology, the director of sales. You're, you are the talent acquisition specialist. You sell the opportunity better than anybody else. You might want to share the load, but don't surrender it to somebody else because you've done all the hard work to get them to here and you're now relying on somebody else to actually close the deal. That's not adding value. That's saying, here you go. If we're adding value to our organisations and we're adding value to the candidates that we're bringing in, they come on the journey with you, right through the journey with you. They've received the email from you. They're being screened over the phone or video interview by you. They're being interviewed by you. They're being booked in to see hiring managers by you. They're getting the feedback from you. This is the talent acquisition specialist role. Don't flick it off to somebody else. When you are engaging a prospective candidate, and I did not come up with these three bullet points, a colleague from an organisation called Paired Sourcing did. The candidate is asking this, why do I care? Why are you reaching out to me? Why are you different? And what is the actual job? I do know the statistic here in the UK for this one. A candidate is being approached by on average 11 internal recruiters on a weekly basis. 11, why are you any different? Are you different because you've palmed it off to somebody else? Hopefully not. What are you doing that is different in terms of the engaging? Are you literally just filling the vacancy or are you speaking to them, keeping them interested? Katrina shared some statistics earlier around the people that accepted jobs potentially had feedback from the organisation within 48 hours of an application. There's a whole lot of stats out there around that. But what are you doing that's different from 10 other people calling your candidate this week? But this is only if you are reaching out to a cold, unknown candidate. If you have your talent pipeline or your talent community or your talent pool, you don't have to do this because they've opted in. They want to hear about what you have on offer. They want to know what's going on in your organisation. You don't have to prove what is the actual job because you've talked about the jobs to the talent community relentlessly as the marketer that you are. These questions need to be answered for cold outreach. So if you're doing sourcing and engagement, that's what your candidate's thinking. And they're getting emails or phone calls from 10 of your peers in the industry. You don't have to have that if you've got the proactive talent pipeline being built right in front of you. Why do your hiring managers come to you? Because they have to? Or are you adding value to what they are looking to you to do? Now, the boat didn't sink because of this bit up here. There was a mother of an iceberg that scraped against the Titanic, but the ship's captain didn't see what was under the water. Do you honestly believe your hiring managers know exactly what you do behind the scenes? Or do they give you a wreck and then start hassling you? Where's the shortlist? Where's the shortlist? Where's the shortlist? If you want to truly add value to these people, to your stakeholders, to the people you work most closely with, they must know what goes on under the surface. 
behind the scenes, back at the desk, whatever you want to say. So if all they think is they've given you the rec and you've done something and you're going to give them a short list, it's up to you to educate what's underneath. How hard is the sourcing piece? What tools are you using to find these people? How did you uncover these passive candidates? What did you use to engage them? How many did you phone screen? What questions did they have? What feedback about the organisation are you having to deal with at the front line? How many did you run behavioural-based or competency-based interviews for? This is why it's taking five days before I'm even responding to you, Mr Hiring Manager. If you let them think this, you're actually not revealing what you do in your job. Because in the big corporates, hiring managers think, just give it to the recruiter. Just give it to the recruiter. As a recruiter, you need to give it back and say, you're coming to me with this, let me define what I'm about to do. Because that way, they're not going to hassle you within 24 hours, where's my shortlist? Because you haven't got a smorgasbord of candidates in your boardroom that you just go and open the door and go, technology anybody? Yep, come this way. How hard is it out there at the moment? Really, really hard. And you're wearing at least three hats. What's this? What is a chameleon? What does it do? It's, it's England here, it's shout. It's camouflage, it, mo it modifies itself. Are you looking for a Gen X? Are you looking for a Gen Y? Are you looking for somebody in sales? Are you looking for passive? Are you headhunting? You have to modulate and modify your behavior around who you're looking for. You cannot source a Gen X head of sales the same way you source a millennial digital marketing analyst. You cannot approach a baby boomer in the same way through one of these engagement ways that you would actually connect with someone who is a millennial. Not possible. So you are modulating your behaviour based on role type, demographic, target audience, etc. And if you aren't doing that, you have to start doing that. If you are running your sourcing, engagement, outreach, attraction, screening and recruiting process, the same way for every candidate across the, the business units, something's wrong. Modulate, chameleon. I'll admit here, one of my 22 or 23 year old staff educated me as to what catfishing means on social media about six months ago. It's very important that you actually understand that sometimes as a sourcer, you need to trawl. You need to find people and you need to actually start in some ways, dumbing yourself down to talk to people here at this level, putting on a slightly different tone when you're talking at this level. You have to become someone you're not if you want to find the best people. If you are you, every single candidate, there is no way you are going to be dynamic enough to attract somebody different. If you walked into a room of people and on this side there were salespeople of around 45, over here, there were techies with their earphones in of around 25. And over here, there was a marketing team of about 35. You would not be the same person talking to each of them about opportunities in your business. And yet, when it comes to the online sourcing world, template, 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 template. It's not going to work. Templates work to the same sort of audience, but they do not work right across your job requisitions. And over here, we have the cyber sleuth, where I'll put up my hand and be very honest here and say, I started in this game in 1994. If I would be starting now, I would hate it. Because we picked up the phone and created org charts. We talked to people. We pretended to be couriers to say, we've got a delivery for the head of finance. I can't read his name on the courier slip. Can you give it to me, please? Everything possible to extract names within organisations. I would call companies at the age of 24 and say, 
Hi, I'm a coordinator for an events company. Can I have everybody in your sales team? I need to send out a handwritten sales invitation. I'd get all the names and I'd go, right, that's my talent pool for the next head of sales role I get. You guys can click, click and click and you've got it and it's running while you're getting a cigarette or some lunch and you come back and send out all the emails. It's a cyber sleuth. What you are actually doing, everything's online, you're finding people today that could not be found 10 or 15 years ago. Do your hiring managers know you do that? Do you tell them what you're doing to actually attract their latest job title that didn't exist five years ago? You have to be proud and confident and aspired by what you do and push it up the line and let everybody internally know what you're doing. Otherwise, just give it to the recruiter. So for those who have the hybrid, to know when to take one hat off and put another hat on is very important. Does the sourcing stop when the list is made? Does the recruiting start when the engagement is made? Does the sourcing morph into recruitment at the outreach component? Or are you actually sourcing all the way through to the point they come in for interview? You have to decide that internally and define where does one role stop and the other begin? Because you then have to be reporting back up and saying, this is how many we've sourced. Is that just the name generation? Or is that how many you've out reached out to via some template method? Or is it how many I've phone screened for you Mr. Hiring Manager or Ms. Hiring Manager, I've phone screened 27 people. Is that recruiting or sourcing? I've interviewed this many. I've given you a short list of this many. Are we in the recruitment process or are we still attracting? Come up with that definition between you and your hiring manager because it changes between market to market, country to country, job to job, industry to industry. And it, you ask a recruiter, what is the difference? And they'll give you a different answer. But you ha if you're truly adding value, you are providing metrics and stats around one element and around another element. You're not saying take a look at the pipeline because the hiring manager doesn't know where you're up to, where you're up to in that. Like I said, does it include the engagement piece? For those doing the sourcing, you probably use all of these tools and some. Um, I put out an ebook about a year ago. It's got about 70 tools in there that help the modern internal recruiter identify email addresses, do the outreach, do pre-qualification culling, do skills assessment. It can absolutely help you add value to what you do. I'll flick through a couple of screens here very quickly to show that you can do things very creatively as well. This is an IKEA um, careers ad. They literally, in every single flat pack box, had this job ad, which is basically how you build a career. So every single person that bought an IKEA flat pack when they opened it was told there's a career at IKEA for anybody looking. They filled 54 jobs in Australia with not one online job posting. That's innovative. This organisation was looking for software engineers. Literally, they had these wrapped around um, phone pillars in, in San Francisco. This is some crazy mathematical equation. The answer is a telephone number and only a software engineer could actually get that. So they knew that if anyone rang that number, they'd crack that code, literally. That's innovative. No job postings, no sourcing. Let's try something in a market where there are geeks and highly intelligent mathematicians. Anyone doing snap locations, companies that are involving Snapchat, it's a quick way to actually get the candidates to engage. That's part of the experience. And Katrina talked about Instagram earlier, so I will move on. Yes, that is me with my car, but let's move on from that around the employer brand. But what I want to ask you is when you last actually applied to a job through your own portal, when did you go through what a candidate goes through today? How many steps? How many clicks? How long does it take? Did you think about ejecting? When did you want to eject? How long has it been since your application process was actually refined? Because if someone is applying on their phone 
between King's Cross and Pancras and Piccadilly, are they ejecting because at question number six, before I even uploading anything, they went, this is far too hard. Are your application processes ejecting certain potential candidates? Is it absolutely clear cut, this is how you apply for any role? Will a millennial apply? Will a baby boomer apply? You should sit down and think about what is your application process doing to a potential candidate? This is real feedback from 800 US clients around candidate experience. Sorry, when I say clients, I mean internally when they ran the survey around candidate experience. And here, nearly 35% of people were saying, I'd like more communication from the internal talent acquisition team. And nearly 30% are saying, I would like to be notified if I'm rejected. 30% of people didn't even hear back from the talent acquisition team because too many internal recruiters, no offence to this audience, focus everything on the hiring manager and when the pressure is on, oh, look, if we don't get back to them, they'll, they'll know that they didn't get the job. And here, what is causing the negative candidate experience is unclear application instructions, extremely long application process and a minimal job description. If you can relate to any of those, they're easy fixes. And you, you might not be able to read these, but like I said, you'll, you'll get the, the presentation. This is feedback about candidate experience. This session was not only about how to add value to your hiring manager, but what can you do to deliver a better candidate experience to people that actually want to come and work with your organisation. These are metrics I'm sure you look into very closely. If you're unsure of what the efficiency ratio is, cost of hire, as I'm sure you understand, is the full cost of recruiting divided by the number of placements made. The efficiency ratio, and you should put this to your managers, is the total cost of recruiting divided by the total salaries of the people brought into the business. Because if you are being measured on cost of hire and you've got entry or you've got only exec, it's going to skew differently compared to if you're just dividing by the number of hires made in an organisation. So always factor in what level you are bringing into your business. And then please, where you can, believe in the silver medalist phenomenon. We work with two of the largest organisations in the United States. They fill 80% of their roles from people who got second place in roles 12 months earlier. So don't ignore the people that you rejected or who didn't get the job. Go back to them. Keep them warm. Tell them about other opportunities in the business. I'm being told to wrap up. I don't like being told to wrap up. Two more slides, I promise. Read this book. It's brilliant. It divides what you do into four categories. Are you providing a need, a service? Have you got a relationship with your hiring managers? Or are you a trusted partner to them? If you are purely delivering a need or a service, you're an internal recruiter. If you are having a relationship with your hiring managers and a trusted partner, you are a talent acquisition specialist. It's a brilliant book. There you go. Balls in your court. Any questions? <laughs>